for slavery in the newly new two territories to be developed. Well, that didn't work so well, and that led to the Missouri Compromise in 1820. The Missouri Compromise was a law passed by Congress that basically admitted Missouri as a slave state and Maine as a free state. And that started the process of really the divisiveness of the country. It was there before, but as a new state came, new states came in, they, because of the divisiveness in the country in the South and the North, they, they tried to have parity so a free state would come in at the same time as a slave state to try to maintain that balance. And it was called the Missouri Compromise. Um, and meanwhile, slavery was prohibited in most of the Western territories, early part of the country's existence. Then we get to Minnesota. Okay? Um, let's see here if I can. All right. So here, Minnesota started to develop. We're in the mid 19th century, 1840s, 1850s. It was still wild, rough territory then. But as Minnesota developed and became populated, many Southerners would come up the Mississippi River and vacation here along St. Anthony Falls. In fact, as we all know, that's where Minneapolis, the Twin Cities basically developed. Well, St. Paul developed a little bit sooner, but Minneapolis developed along the St. Anthony Falls. And Saint, that St. Anthony, Maine area, St. Anthony, Maine, there were resorts and hotels there. And that's what the primary um, location that Southerners would vacation in the in, in the summer. It was so it was so oppressive in the South, and you know, there's no obvious no air conditioning. So many wealth, many many wealthy Southerners would come up the Mississippi, vacation at St. Anthony, Maine, right on the Mississippi. Of course, they bring with them their household retinue, which includes slaves. Not all of them, but they have slaves come up there with them. So if you if you kind of took a picture of Minnesota in the 1850s, pre-Civil War, you'd see. Um, and the banks of the Mississippi, where St. Anthony, Maine is, and St. Anthony Falls, right outside the downtown area, there'd be a, a resorts there, basically catering to wealthy Southerners who would have some slaves. They wouldn't have slaves working them, but they'd have household slaves attending them. Okay? So Minnesota had a fair number of slaves in the summer here. It was probably recognized. The main re resort or retreat as it was called back then, was Winslow House. Winslow House still exists. Any of you been to Winslow House? You know what I'm talking about? There's a big con a big high-rise condo right in St. Anthony, Maine. It's called the Winslow House. Yeah. It's very nice. Very I am. Um, it's right behind the restaurants along St. Anthony, Maine. It's called the Winslow House. That was the name of the resort that existed on the banks of the Mississippi, where the southerner, the main resort where the southerners come in the 1860s. There was a famous case that occurred in 1850, in the 1850s, called the Eliza Winston case. I won't go into great depth on it, except I'll say this. Eliza Winton, not to be confused with Winslow, was a slave for a Southern family that vacationed at the Winslow house. Eliza, Win Eliza Winston, the slave, escaped, went across the river to St. Paul, and declared her freedom. She didn't want to be a slave anymore. She didn't want to go back down south when the summer was over. A number of uh, residents in St. Paul took her in, but the owners of Eliza Whitten, they were owners at that time, the slave owners, went to court to petition that she comes back to them as their property. The court in, on that occasion, the Ramsey County Court, downtown St. Paul, ruled against the slave owners because of the Missouri kind being Northwest Ordinance and those can't have slavery here in Minnesota. And then she was given her freedom. Uh, the slave owners, though, did contested that and were taking an appeal on that up to the higher court. She, meanwhile, left St. Paul, lived in, uh, went to Canada, and lived the rest of her life in Canada. But that was the Eliza Winston case about whether slavery could be uh, allowed here. In terms of population, there was about a dozen blacks who lived in Minnesota in 1850, pre-state, or Minnesota became a state in 1858. Minnesota became a state in 1858. The Minnesota Constitution has this clause in it. No slavery or involuntary servitude. Minnesota was called a free state, and it's in the Constitution, 1858. 1860, even the Civil War, there were 259 blacks in Minnesota, almost all the Twin Cities. So there are some in northern Minnesota, it's fur trade, the fur, fur trade business. Um, but the, but uh, the population of the state was about 170,000 in the first census, census, census after Minnesota became a state, 20, 259 blacks. Interestingly, according to the records from the War Department, which was called back then, about 100 blacks from Minnesota participated in the Civil War. 
and there were only there were 279 blacks recorded in the census. Census figures back then were somewhat imprecise. They are today too. But nevertheless, about a third of the blacks who lived in Minnesota were participated in the um, U.S. Army in the uh, Civil War. Now we get to the Dred Scott decision. All this is happening in the late 1850s. I'm going backwards a little bit. Um, um, the Dred Scott case was the signature event that precipitated the Civil War. There's a lot of other things going on. Uncle Tom's cabin, um, the splitting up of political parties. But the Dred Scott case was the match that ignited the fuse to the Civil War. It happened here in Minnesota. Dred Scott was a slave. He was enslaved with his family. He had a wife, Harriet, and two daughters. And he was enslaved to a military doctor. Doctor attached to the military. He lived for a while in Wisconsin. Got my, got my pointer here, but they lived for a while in Wisconsin. And they lived for a while in Minnesota was not a state back then. This is the 1840s, early 1850s. It was, this was Minnesota's part of what was called the Wisconsin Territory. Dred Scott was with the doctor in Wisconsin. He then, the doctor was then transferred to Fort Snelling. And the doctor spent two years, three years actually, at Fort Snelling with Dred Scott and Dred Scott's family. They lived in the basement of the infirmary at Fort Snelling, which still stands. The building, it's not used for me now, but if you visit St. Anthony, at uh, um, Fort Snelling, if you visit Fort Snelling, you know, on the tours, they show you the building where Dred Scott and his family lived in the basement of the infirmary, still standing there. Dred Scott sued for freedom. Because he claimed, rightfully so, at least from his standpoint, he, his claim was that he had lived in non slave territory, Wisconsin, and in the Northwest Ordinance and the Missouri Compromise and all that. He said, I lived for two or three years in non slave territory. Therefore, I should be given my freedom because slavery wasn't recognized in the places I was living, Minnesota and Wisconsin and Minnesota. There was a series of lawsuits that spanned about 10 years in federal court, state court down in Missouri. Why Missouri? Because his doc, the doctor who owned him was a resident of Missouri. So it got all complicated. But ultimately, it led to the Supreme, went to the Supreme Court. And that case is called the Dred Scott case. Dred Scott versus Sanford, 1857. The issue was, by virtue of living in free territory, is, is Dred Scott a free man? and no longer a slave. That was the issue that was presented to the United States Supreme Court. Incidentally, the decision by the Supreme Court, which I'll get to in a minute, was leaked. Remember that whole controversy about the Dobbs decision being leaked? That was leaked a few days before the Supreme Court published it. And in, the, in his inaugural address in 1857, James Buchanan, who was universally rated one of the worst presidents, although those changes keep changing, James Buchanan was the president before Lincoln in his inaugural speech hinted that he knew what the decision was. He said there's a case pending before the Supreme Court. He said once that case is decided, that should settle now and forever the slavery issue. So he knew what the decision was. That was leaked to him before his inauguration. Two days later, the decision came out. Well, what was the decision? Right? This is the decision. There were three prongs to the decision. The Supreme Court, with a seven to two, seven to two decision, said that blacks have no rights warranting quote respect. That was the word they used. Slaves are property; they're not people. Slaves are property. The legal term for that is chattel, C H A T T E L. Because they're property, they can't sue. A piece of property can't sue. A, a chair or a, uh, an animal or a vehicle can't sue. You have to be a person to sue. Blacks are not persons. They're slave, they're property. And furthermore, to go one step further, because they're property, because blacks are property, the law can't ban people taking their property wherever they want, including the new territories which were emerging in the West. So the court said if the slaves are property of their owners, the owners can take them anywhere they want. Slave states cannot bar slavery because you can't prevent someone from going from one state to the next with their property. Well, that was the rule. Slavery cannot be barred anyway. That led to this notion of popular sovereignty. I won't get into that right now. But it also was deemed to be a self-inflicted wound. It just was a firestorm 
at that point, because as we all know, the, the issue over slavery and abolition was all brewing at that time. This decision, a Supreme Court decision was, forget about all that abolition, forget about all that. It's over. Like Buchanan said, there's no longer the issues resolved. Supreme Court said, you can't do anything about slavery. It exists, and it's gonna exist forever because it's property rights. That's what the Supreme Court said. Oops, I lost it here. Uh-oh, okay. Oops. Among other things, it was the Dred Scott decision that prompted a former politician to return to politics. He was a one-term congressman in the 1840s from Illinois named Abraham Lincoln. And after the Dred Scott decision, he said, I better get back into politics. And he did, he ran in 1858 against Stephen Douglas, the famous Lincoln Douglas debates, and we all know where that, you know, he lost that election, although he had more popular votes. It's a different issue. But he, but he became a national figure because of the famous Lincoln Douglas debates, but it was a Dred Scott decision that got Lincoln back into politics. And Lincoln's position, incidentally, pre-Civil War, and even during the early days of the Civil War, Lincoln did not, was positioned, was that he was not in favor of barring uh, or prohibiting slavery in the states where it existed in the South. Lincoln was not an abolitionist early on. He said where it existed in the South, pre previous to the Northwest Ordinance of the Missouri Compromise, I can't mess with it because it's property. Like the lawyers they can't, can't take away someone's property. Lincoln accepted the Dred Scott decision, except this part of it. That slavery can't be borrowed somewhere else. Lincoln said, okay, slavery is okay in my mind if it's confined to where it existed. But prohibiting, any, I'm sorry, barring any prohibition of slavery is going to make this country almost all slavery. And that was a predicate of it. The house divided against itself cannot stand. That was Lincoln's phrase because of the Dred Scott decision. Lincoln said, look, this court case is going to lead to slavery proliferating throughout the country. And he was okay confining it to the South because he figured it would die out in the South, or at least he was happy, not happy, but he was okay with that. And that was his position that got him ultimately elected president, the Republican Party was born based on that premise, and you know, the rest is history. Um, Lincoln, of course, changed his view on abolition in part during the Civil War. I say in part because the famous Emancipation Proclamation in 1863 did not free all slaves. The Emancipation Proclamation was not, a, did not free slavery, free slaves. The Emancipation Proclamation was issued as a military order. And Lincoln's directive was that any places where the Union Army is occupied, they can claim, they can free the slaves there as an act of war. They, they can take the enemy's property. Just like the Union Army could you know, take over plantations and whatever, as an act of war. Lincoln premised the Emancipation Proclamation and his powers as commander in chief to say that slaves can be freed in any territory occupied by the government by the army at that time. The army did not occupy that much in the South. They're still fighting the Civil War. So and that was that was kind of the Dred Scott case was the major precipitating factor in the Civil War. If you're in a trivia contest, that's the answer. Okay. Forget about that New Zealand. <laughs> All right, so we have the Emancipation Proclamation. After the Civil War, uh, we have the post-Civil War amendments, Article 13 through, uh, Amendments 13 through 50. The 13th Amendment barred slavery. Okay. They needed that because the Emancipation Proclamation did not free the slaves. It was an act of war. Once the war was over, slaves could, the masters could regain their slaves, presumably, because it was, the war was no longer out. But the 13th Amendment barred slavery. Well, slavery should be allowed in the country. That was in 1865. Yes, Michelle. Do you think the American proclamation doing it as an act of war was intended to be kind of a precursor in setting the stage? Oh, yeah. Or sure, commitment? sure. I mean, Lincoln was pretty cautious about that. First of all, he didn't want to lose the border states, you know, from a military standpoint. He freed this, you know, there were, and there were slavery still in some northern states. Delaware had slavery throughout the Civil War. Maryland, Kentucky, not a lot of it, but there was some of it. So Lincoln was very cautious, and Lincoln also, as a lawyer, figured that, hey, the Supreme Court said you can't bar slavery, but this is, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not basing this decision on property rights, I'm basing it on act of war as the commander-in-chief of the military. It was a military directive to the military, the generals, that what they could do in the field in, ca in, uh, in, in capturing enemy property. Okay? But it was probably a pre predecessor of that, because by that point, Lincoln did want to free the slaves, and this was one, one step in that direction. Um, in the in the late part of this, in the late, latter stages of the Civil War, early part of 19, 1865, 
but it was pretty clear the Union was going to win, and it was just months away, early part of you know, the Civil War ended in April of 19, 1865 at Appomattox. But there were peace talks, going, they were called peace talks, going on between the North and the South. Lincoln attended one of them, um, and they were negotiating, trying to negotiate a peace. And the South uh, position was that they would come back in the Union, and they'd drop their arms, and they'd end the war. The South was willing to, quote, surrender if Lincoln rescinded the Emancipation Proclamation. Lincoln said, once I free a man, I'll never see him be a slave again. So by that point, Lincoln said, no, it's a little bit too late for that, guys. You know, when you're fired on Fort Sumter, you, you know, you don't ask, don't ask for something you don't want. You might get it. So uh, the fourth, so the 13th Amendment freed slaves. The 14th Amendment was the famous due process equal protection clause, which had been used for all this litigation, equal protect, equal rights for um, women, equal rights for blacks, same, same sex rights. That's the 14th Amendment, which is morphed into that. And the 15th Amendment gave blacks the right to vote. It said nobody shall be prohibited from voting based on their uh, based on their race or color. That's the 15th Amendment. However, before that, many states allowed blacks to vote it, it, before the Civil Rights and War Amendments. In Minnesota, there was a proposal during the Civil War to allow blacks to vote. There weren't many of them, but it was more of a, a moral cause. And twice, two times that was on the ballot here in Minnesota, and it was defeated by about 1,500 votes. So Minnesota voted twice against allowing blacks to vote. That was before the 15th Amendment. Finally, in, 19, in 1869, uh, Minnesota changed its view and, and ratified the right to vote for slaves um, in the 15th Amendment. By 1870, we had 750 blacks, which were called colored, in the census here in Minnesota, 1870, 750 blacks. Meanwhile, there's some legislation enacted here in Minnesota that didn't get a lot of attention, but it was called the Equal Accommodations Act. This is a Minnesota law back in 1885, 20 years after the Civil War. The Equal Accommodations Act said that no public facility, accommodations they call it, public accommodations, can bar or prohibit people from attending a public accommodation based on their race. What's a public accommodation? Schools, restaurants, hotels, any public facility, parks, beaches. It was called the Equal Accommodations Act here in Minnesota. And it was in 1885. That was the predecessor, 70 years later, of the Civil Rights Act, the Federal Civil Rights Act. Most states did not have laws like that. Many northern states allowed blacks, of course, to go to public currency. But the Federal Civil Rights Act in 1964, the one that required facilities to allow blacks to be on the premises and so on and so forth, mainly directed to the South, but not only the South, that was derived from the Minnesota law. Minnesota law was the first one in the country that recognized the rights of blacks to go to public accommodations. How, uh, how does that fit with like separate? But equal. Like, it you is separate. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, separate but equal is the famous Brown versus Board of Education case in 1954, but it's, it's all interrelated. The, 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 the separate but equal, yeah, it was the Jim Crow laws. And the, the separate but equal dealt with that issue in schools. And then, of course, it grew from there into uh, public accommodation. Do you remember the restaurant sit ins? Uh, oops, during that time. Yeah, I put that in here. Which button? Anyway. Plessy versus Ferguson, Milly, and Zimmerman. 1896 was Plessy versus Ferguson. In Plessy versus Ferguson, a city owned streetcar um, in New Orleans at Jim Crow section, black, white. Blacks had to sit in the back of the bus. And one man challenged that, and that was a separate but equal case. The Supreme Court in that case said it's okay if you can separate the races as long as they're equal facilities. And sitting in the back of the bus isn't so much different than the front of the bus. Okay. So Plessy versus Ferguson validated separate but equal. The Brown versus Board of Education case, 1954, overruled Plessy versus Ferguson as it applies to schools. But then, of course, that concept then became, began being applied everywhere, beaches and public facilities and all that. And that led to the enactment of the Civil Rights Act in 1964, which essentially, by, at least on the by its terms, the law said you can't have separate. But that was a long evolution. It all started back in Minnesota. Yes, Jillian. So when you say that the Civil Rights Act was derived from our law, mm -hmm. is that a, because they're so similar and because we were first, you're drawing that conclusion? Right. Was that actually a historical record that said 
we should do what Minnesota. Did. No, no, I, was, I took a little bit of poetic license. It's derived <laughs> in sense that it's the same, it's essentially the same law. Right. It's, it's a, but right. I, at the time they enacted it, they weren't looking back at Minnesota. I don't think I'm saying, hey, Minnesota has this law 50 years ago. Why don't we use that? But it's certainly the predecessor. It set the stage just as something else that we we all know about these restrictive covenants and deeds, right? We're all familiar with that. Deeds that say you can't sell to mainly black Jews, Asians, Native Americans, but they're mainly they were mainly directed to blacks and, and Jews to a significant extent. Restrictive deeds. And as you know, we have this new law in Minnesota where people can go back and change their deeds and remove those restrictive covenants. Golden Valley has been the leader, the vanguard in that. Golden Valley was the first city to start assisting people in removing these restrictive covenants and the deeds. And they grew up in the early part of the 20th century, um, directed to blacks and, and Jews largely. And, 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 and Minnesota passed a law in 1919 that said that prohibited those restrictive covenants and deeds, but no one paid much attention to it. Okay? Well, that's fine. Throw it on the books. We don't care. We're going to do what we want. But Minnesota preceded all these other laws, that, all these other laws that came later restricting those. Barring those restrictive covenants and deeds that preceded the 1948 case of Shelley versus Kramer. That's a Supreme Court case in which the Supreme Court said we ruled that these restrictive covenants and deeds are not valid and can't be enforced. 1948. So we know that that solved that problem. Sort of. It was ignored. They said, well, too bad. Yeah. Um, I, I remember very vividly as a youth. Um, seeing these ads in the newspaper, Sunday newspaper, for housing, new houses being constructed in South Tyrell Hills. Um, and they, I remember this so vividly, and they had a phrase in there, and I remember asking my parents what that phrase means. This was in the ad, showing these houses being, you know, come to the South Tyrell Hills North, uh, here in Golden Valley. It said, restricted area. And I remember at that time I was in, Fifth or sixth grade, and I remember talking and learning about fallout shelters and nuclear um, nuclear bombs and all that. And I thought restricted means that they wouldn't allow people to be in that area because there was some hazardous danger there. Uh -uh, that's not what restricted meant. Okay? That was here in Golden Valley, which is a large one of the main reasons, a principal reason, <laughs> why St. Louis Park became so heavily populated with Jews. The Jews who moved out of North Minneapolis. Many of them, the natural stopping point would have been Golden Valley. Golden Valley was rife with those restrictive covenants. Okay? They were in gold, the South Tyrone Hills had them. I lived in South Tyrone Hills for a while, and yet it was an RD to my wife, whose parents lived in North Tyrone, right by Breck School, that whole area by Breck School there. They had these restrictive covenants in their own deeds saying you can't sell the blacks and just, and some of them were enforced, some of them weren't, but even if they weren't enforced, they certainly set a mindset among sellers and real estate people, because that's what they were really directed to. No one's going to court to fight this. The real estate industry kept blacks, to some extent Jews, out of certain areas. And you know, you need, there was no Jews in the until 1980. It was restricted, not by law necessarily, but by practice and custom. Same with blacks and others. Okay? But, that, but Minnesota had this law in the books that no one paid much attention to, so we can't handle it. Finally, in 1955, the Minnesota Human Rights Act reinforced the prohibition, prohibition on restrictive deeds. And in 1962, Minnesota passed a law that, spent, that said you can't have those restrictions and deeds. But they were generally you know, applied, uh, uh, adhered to as a matter of custom and practice until 1968, at least, when the Federal Civil Rights Act, the Federal, Federal Housing Act was enacted. But um, it was interesting recently. This is about three months ago. The Twin Cities uh, real estate industry, Minnesota, the Minneapolis Greater Board of Realty, which is the largest real group of realtors in the state, um, passed a resolution apologizing for its role in uh, the uh, restriction in, in deeds, primarily directed to blacks. Although, um, while the deeds were largely restricted, directed to blacks, uh, it didn't have as much an impact in some ways as it did on Jews um, because. Back in the 40s and 50s and 60s, let's face it, there weren't a lot of black people in the Twin Cities, and there weren't a lot of them frankly, who could afford housing in the suburbs or in better neighborhoods. So that, while I, I, I'm not minimizing it, I'm saying that the, the restrictive deeds had a bigger impact in many ways on our housing pattern for Jews in the 40s, 50s, and 60s than it did for blacks. The impact on blacks came more later, later 
in the 70s, 80s, and 90s when blacks became more middle class and affluent and able to buy houses. But nevertheless, it permeated the real estate industry. The real estate industry has apologized for its role in that. It made some amends. Another area where I think it's significant to look at black rights, what the rights of blacks is in education. There's a lot of other areas, but I'm just focusing on a couple of them. The Minnesota state constitution has a specific provision that requires the state to provide for a general and uniform system of public schools. That's called the adequate education clause. It's in the state constitution. It's not in the federal constitution. The federal constitution doesn't mention education. The federal government, except for funding, doesn't have a big role in education. It has a role in funding, but there's no laws there's no constitutional right to education. It's in the states. And Minnesota, so the Minnesota Constitution has vague language about that. A general and uniform system of public schools. That the Minnesota Constitution was the basis for a lot of the racial related litigation here in Minnesota. We didn't have separate but equal in Minnesota. Uh, we didn't we didn't have Brown versus Board of Education. Blacks attended schools with whites. I went to a lot of them. Well, my school that I went to, we had about 25% of our my classmates were black, but but, certain, but but it was largely a matter of where people lived back in those days, as we all know, you went to the neighborhood schools, there wasn't this open enrollment and all that. So blacks generally lived in particular areas, usually lesser income areas, and you know, there, there weren't a lot of, there, were, there wasn't much integration issues there. But Minneapolis school busing case in 1970, in 1970s was the first case that required busing in Minnesota to try to break up the racial segregation that exists in school. There wasn't a law requiring separate people schools, but as a practical matter, that became those de facto segregation. The fact was that most, you know, some schools were largely black and no blacks were in many, many other schools because of where they lived. Minnesota, Minnesota um, school busing case was one of the first cases. Remember all that big controversy, 70s, 80s, 90s, where busing was a big issue? It's a hot button issue. People would be protesting and, you know, and there'd be uh, some violent protests. And, was an election issue, a political issue. It, it isn't anymore, but it certainly was back then. But Minnesota, Minneapolis was the was the um, leader in in the busing concept. And there's a case called Baker versus Special School District Number One. Special School District Number One is Minneapolis. Okay. Um, now there's certain there's litigation going on. Um, there's litigation going on now that's been going on since 2015 called the Cruz Guzman case. Some of you may have heard of this. It's, it's a significant case. It's got a lot of complexity to it, but basically the claimants in that case, which are a group of largely black parents supported by the NAACP and other interest groups, are trying to establish a essentially a twin city school district rather than having separate school districts in Minneapolis, St. Paul, Robbinsdale, um, Hopkins, try to have one major school district in which students can move around from any portion of the district to different schools. Now that case was started in 2015, it was basically an attempt to desegregate the, the de facto part of schools in, in, in the Twin Cities. Some of that is a little bit, I won't say moot, but less important now or less significant because of the you know, ability for students to go to almost any school they want and they can pick out whatever school they want. And it's a little bit less prevalent, but nevertheless, there's litigation going on it's been going on through the court system since 2015, and it's still going on. And but the problem is the courts are having a problem, among other things, trying to figure out what to do here. I mean, just saying, okay, everybody can be in the same school district. Goodbye, have a nice day. Raising a lot of different issues of financing and taxes and other things. So it's a it's a mess to try to do that. But they're trying to do that through the court system. Meanwhile, there's another proposal to amend the Minnesota state constitution to require to require essentially more funding for public schools that will allow more racial integration. That um, proposal is called the Page Amendment, named after Evelyn Page, who's advancing that. So there's a lot going on there in education, there's a lot going on there in housing, and I think that's a significant evolution from where we were back in 1836, when Dred Scott and his family lived in the infirmary of Fort Snelling. So there's a short, quick tour of Minnesota history regarding the black, civil rights and other rights for black people in connection with and in, in, in anticipation of next month's black history. Hope you found this interesting and informative. Thank you very much.